Okay, so today we're going to be talking about cycles of matter within the biosphere, within the geosphere, with going on within Earth. So, unlike the one-way flow of energy, matter is recycled within and between ecosystems over and over and over and over again. And when we talk about matter, we're also including nutrients. Now, elements like the carbon, the oxygen, all that, they pass from one organism to another and among parts of the biosphere through closed loops. This is known as the biogeochemical cycle. Now, as matter moves through the ecosystem, it's not created or destroyed. It's just transformed by biological processes, the earth, human activity, or chemical processes. Now, when we talk about the biogeochemical cycle, we have bio, which means biological processes. We're talking about any and all activities performed by living organisms. We're talking about the geo chemical cycle, geological processes, volcanic eruptions, weathering of rock, major movements of matter within and below the surface of the earth. Geo means earth. So when we talk about geological processes, we're talking about processes inside and outside the earth. Now, chemical and physical processes, the formation of clouds and rain, the flow of running water and the action of lightning. We also have human activity, the mining and burning of fossil fuels, clearing of land for building and farming, burning of forests and the manufacture and use of fertilizers. That's just one slide on the recycling in the biosphere. Now, the previous processes we just discussed on the previous slide pass the same atoms and molecules around again and again over and over. They're not created or destroyed. They're just transformed. So let's use our imagination for a moment. Imagine you're a carbon atom and the following scenario could happen to you. You're a carbon atom and you're shot out of a volcano. You've been around since the beginning of the universe and you're shot out of a volcano. No big deal. A nearby plant absorbs you during photosynthesis. So you were in a volcano, now you're in a plant. Well, you become part of the carbohydrate molecule of the blueberry plant. A deer comes by and eats the blueberry plant and within a few hours you pass out of the deer. A dung beetle swallows you and then is eaten by a shrew. An owl swoops out of the sky and eats the shrew. You get released back into the atmosphere when the owl exhales carbon dioxide. So within a matter of probably a week or two, you've gone to completely different places, but you were not created or destroyed. You were just recycled through various stages. All right, This carbon atom has always been around. All right, a carbon atom in you could have come from anywhere or have been part of anything at any time. Now, let's talk about the water cycle briefly here. Have you ever seen rain, snow, or a river? If so, you have seen the water cycle. Now, water continuously moves between the oceans, the atmosphere, and land. It can move between organisms, outside or inside of them. Now, water enters the atmosphere from bodies of water. We call this evaporation or out from the leaves of plants, which we call transpiration. If the water vapor cools, it can, it can turn into precipitation, rain, snow, sleet, or hail, and fall when it becomes large enough. Now, precipitation called runoff is when the water flows along the surface until it enters a river or stream that carries it to a lake or ocean. Precipitation called groundwater is absorbed into the soil. Now, groundwater can enter the plants through the roots or flow in the rivers, streams, lakes, or oceans. It can even penetrate deep into the ground and become part of a water reservoir, like the Florida aquifer. When the water re-enters the atmosphere, the cycle starts all over again. So all these water molecules, this H2O, it's just being recycled over and over and over. We're not getting more rain. We're not getting less rain on the earth. It's all happening over and over and over. Now, certain parts may get more rain. Certain parts of the earth may get less rain during certain seasons, but all that water has been here since the beginning. All right, nutrient cycles. So nutrients. When we talk about nutrients, we're talking about the chemical substances organisms need to sustain life. They need those in order to live. Now, every organism needs nutrients to build tissues and carry out life functions. Nutrients pass through the environment through the biogeochemical cycles, which we talked about earlier. Now, there are three pathways or cycles that move those, these nutrients through the environment. The first one is the carbon cycle. That deals with carbon, which is why it's called the carbon cycle. The second one is the nitrogen cycle, which deals with nitrogen. And the last one, the phosphorus cycle, which deals with 
phosphorus. Scientists have cut us a huge break here, naming these exactly what they deal with. In all three cycles, oxygen participates by combining with them. Carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, oxygen is combining with them. Now, oxygen gas is released in the atmosphere by the most important of all biological activities, photosynthesis. Without photosynthesis, there would not be enough oxygen on Earth for us to breathe. A lot of people think that plants depend on us. It's the other way around. We depend on plants. They were here before us. They'll be here after us. Oxygen is used in respiration by all multicellular forms of life and many single-celled organisms too. Now this includes plants. We'll talk more on this later. All right, the carbon cycle. Carbon is a major component of all organic compounds such as lipids, nucleic acids, carbohydrates, and proteins. You will find carbon in each of those. And those are the macromolecules which we talked about uh, earlier. Also found in tissue, animal skeletons, and several kinds of rock. Now CO2 in the atmosphere is important for photosynthesis. Now some carbon compounds that were once a part of ancient forests have been buried and through a geological process have been turned into coal. So the carbon isn't getting created, it's not getting destroyed, it's just getting transformed. And you might be saying at this point, well, where did the carbon come from? It came from an exploding star at one point. So if you're wondering where all these came from, they came from the formation and explosion of stars. Now, marine organisms of the past who have died and sank to the bottom of the ocean have transformed into natural gas or oil. This is why they're called fossil fuels. Now, plants take in carbon dioxide to make nutrients and then are passed on to consumers when the plant is eaten. The carbon may be used to build or grow the skeleton or be released as carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Carbon is not created or destroyed, simply transformed like we stated earlier. Now, the nitrogen cycle. Nitrogen is required by living organisms to make amino acids, which in turn make proteins and nucleic acids, which further combine to form DNA and RNA. Now, many different forms of nitrogen occur naturally in the biosphere. So we're talking about living things here because of the bio part. Nitrogen gas, N2, makes up 78% of the atmosphere. Now, other nitrogen can be found in the soil, bodily waste, dead and decaying organic matter. Now, sometimes the bacteria can use nitrogen gas from the atmosphere directly, and this is called nitrogen fixation. Now, these primary producers use nitrogen to make nutrients. It's similar to photosynthesis, just without the sunlight and carbon. Now, consumers eat these primary producers to make their own nitrogen compounds, the nucleic acids, the proteins, the amino acids, etc., and they release nitrogen back into the environment through waste. Now, decomposers release nitrogen from the waste or dead decaying organic matter that producers can take up and use all over again. So we're recycling it. That's why it's called the nitrogen cycle, the carbon cycle, the phosphorus cycle. It's being recycled over again and again, not being created, not being destroyed, just transformed. Now, other bacteria obtain energy by converting nitrates into nitrogen gas that is released into the atmosphere. This is called denitrification. All right, that is denitrification. Now, humans add nitrogen to the biosphere by using or manufacturing fertilizer. Let's talk about the phosphorus cycle. Phosphorus is essential because it helps form DNA and RNA. There is not an abundance in the atmosphere like there is nitrogen, but there is an abundance on land in the form of phosphate rock, soil minerals, and in the ocean as dissolved phosphate and phosphate sediments. Now, as rocks and sediments wear down, phosphate is released. Now, some of the phosphate stays on land, while other parts of the phosphate move into organisms or the ocean. Not a lot moves into the water, though. Most of that is going to stay on land and be used by the organisms on the land. Organic phosphate moves from producers to consumers and to the rest of the ecosystem. If ample sunlight and water are available, the primary productivity of an ecosystem may be limited by the availability of nutrients. So a plant that uses photosynthesis may have enough sunlight, it may have the amount of water it needs, but it may not have the nutrients it needs to carry out the life processes. And when we talk about the availability of nutrients and for a organism to do what it needs to do, we're talking about primary productivity. And that's the rate at which primary producers create organic material. And when we talk about primary producers, we're talking about autotrophs. Now if a single essential nutrient is in short supply, primary productivity will be limited. 
The nutrient whose supply limits productivity is called the limiting nutrient. So if we have one nutrient that's in short supply that is stopping or limiting the primary productivity, that nutrient that is not rapidly or abundantly available is called the limiting nutrient. All right, so let's talk about nutrient limitation in soil. Farmers overcome nutrient limitation in soil by adding fertilizers. Now, most fertilizers contain large amounts of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, which help plants grow in soil where these things are absent. The only thing not found is carbon, and that is because plants take in carbon through photosynthesis. There's no need to add carbon. That'd be a waste of time and a waste of money. Plants will take in carbon on their own. Now, all nutrient cycles work together, and when one nutrient is in short supply, the entire system shuts down and comes to a stop. All right, let's talk about nutrient limitation in aquatic ecosystems. In the ocean, nitrogen is the limiting nutrient and only contains about one ten thousandth of that found in soil. There's not a lot of nitrogen available in the ocean. Now, in streams, lakes, and rivers, phosphorus is a limiting nutrient. The nutrients enter the water usually after a heavy rain as runoff. For example, if there is a heavy, heavily fertilized area, the water will run nitrogen into the water. When there is a sudden increase in nutrients, the primary producers can reproduce rapidly and cause a disturbance in the entire ecosystem if there are not enough consumers to keep that population in check or in control. If there is a sudden increase in nitrogen, this leads to things like an algae bloom and it can get out of control and very hard for things to get back to normal. So that's it. That's it for the cycles of matter. If you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email or leave a comment below.